Last time we talked about what the betrayed needed to feel safe. And today I want to tell you what my betrayed spouse, Samantha, needed from me if she was going to feel safe. To recap, I know last time it was pretty direct and, and pretty kind of in your face. And, and I don't apologize for that unless it was too soon for you to hear something like that. And I'm sorry if it was too much. But safety is one of the main pillars to recovery when you're dealing with addiction or infidelity of any kind. You're going to have to have a safe environment. And I promise you, if you will create a safe environment, everything gets easier. There'll still be tough times, there'll still be reminders and triggers, but the reminders and triggers will dissipate slowly but surely. You'll see an incredible sense of momentum start to flow because the betrayed spouse feels safe, the unfaithful spouse is committed to doing what needs to be done, and there's a sense of harmony. So today, I'm going to just tell you what we needed to do, or excuse me, what I needed to do to help Samantha feel safe in her own recovery. Number one, I was never to meet with a woman alone, or if I was put in a situation uh, because of the type of business that I went into immediately after leaving the ministry, I was to tell Samantha about it later on that night or even in the afternoon. I was to say, hey, I had a meeting I was with this woman about uh, this, that, or the other. Um, we kind of talked about this. It only lasted about this long. Um, and, just, and just tell her, yeah, it was kind of a quicker meeting because I would try and make them quick. Uh, and I, you know, there was just a grace for it. I didn't have a lot of meetings alone with women. It just, call it luck, call it whatever you want to call it, but it just didn't happen a lot. So when it did, I handled it very carefully and uh, explained it to Samantha uh, on a granular level and then said, so what questions would you like to ask me because I want to make you feel safe and I want you to know everything that went on. Number two is... I was not glued to my phone. When I was in the middle of my affair, I had my phone all the time. I mean, I carried it with me. I flipped it around. I did. A, I mean, it was always with me. No one could ever touch it, and it had to be by me. So when, when Samantha said to me, I'm willing to give recovery a shot, but I need these things, one of them was, when you come home from work, you're going to put your phone down. And, and I could check it periodically, and there was nothing wrong if... If I had to make a phone call that it was important or something like that, uh, she was fine with that, but the overall um, approach was I put that phone down, I checked it periodically, but it was not glued to me when I was at home. That was something that she needed to feel safe and to feel like I was at home with her, connecting with her and with the kids. This is a funny one. Before my affair became public, I really was just arrogant and thought the world revolved around me. And so Samantha, right in front of Rick one day, said, I want you to mow our lawn. I want you to take the trash cans to the curb and put them back in the garage, and I don't want you to bitch and complain about it. I want you to do it, and I want you to do it gladly. I want you to mow the lawn, water the lawn. I want you to do yard work. And she said, I don't want you to pay for someone to do it. We didn't really have the money at that time for that anyway. And she said, that shows me that you're being a regular guy with a regular house and a regular opinion of himself. You're not an arrogant blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, okay, gladly. Um, when we were at the EMS weekend, some of the other spouses laughed. They were like, really? But yeah, that communicated to her safety. It communicated to her that I was thinking about other things besides me and my own world and how I could get my needs met. It communicated that I cared about fatherly, husbandly things. And it meant a lot to her. To this day, I still take the trash cans out myself. I have a teenager, and occasionally he'll do it, but most of the time I do it because I want her to know that I'm committed to doing the things that make her feel safe even 10 years down the road. Number four is that I would meet with Rick periodically. Uh, early on, I met with him every couple of weeks, uh, depending on just our finances and, and commission checks that would come in. Uh, but I met with him as best I could every two weeks or so. 
the next one is I would meet with my mentor or talk to my mentor every week or every two weeks. Uh, it was a guy out of Oklahoma, to this day one of the greatest guys in the world. I love him dearly. He had been through infidelity. He knew how to be gracious. He knew how to be loving and he knew how to take me behind the woodshed. And so she wanted me to talk with him as often as I wanted to and it was really never an issue but we would we would meet over the phone at least every two weeks. Oftentimes it was once a week. This was a big one. I was to answer my phone anytime she called. If I couldn't answer it, I was to send a text within about two minutes of her phone call. If she called me and I didn't answer, and if, she, and if I didn't text her, she was going to wait ten minutes and she was going to call me again. And if I didn't answer, after that secondary phone call, all hell was going to break loose. I knew that she was going to flood. I knew that she would be triggered. I knew that something was going to be wrong in her mind. And so even when I was with clients, I would take that call or I would say, listen, excuse me, uh, I've got to talk to my wife. There's something really important we're having to navigate through. And I would text her or I would call her. And you know what? Nothing was more important than Samantha in my family. So if I had a client get upset or if I lost a client because I took a phone call from my wife, you know what? So be it. Because nothing was more important than creating safety for Samantha. So most of these are all pretty practical. I mean, it's not giving blood sample every week or every day. It's not like I was submitting a DNA test. I mean, these were practical, everyday things that I needed to do if I wanted Samantha to feel safe. And I encourage you, what do you need betrayed spouses to feel safe? Unfaithful? Commit to it. Again, it's got to be realistic. It can't be out of a vindictive, angry, I'm going to make you suffer heart of the betrayed. It has to be something that's practical. Maybe it's a date once a week. Maybe it's going to bed at the same time every night. I don't know. But I just encourage you and I want to challenge you very lovingly. Do this. It will change the entire atmosphere of your recovery. Unfaithful? Make it your biggest priority to make your spouse feel safe. Betrayed spouse, graciously, lovingly, but yet strategically, find what it is that you need to feel safe and submit it to your spouse and say, tell me how we can make this work. I think you'll notice a big difference.